we have Peg Kong, a Vancouver reporter, who will be more moderating, Guillermo Serrano, a children's book author, travel writer, and videographer, Adrian Kujibasi, thank you, uh, a travel writer and editor, and Mark Sisson, a travel writer and photographer. And uh, before I start, just to mute your electronic devices, and please let us give a more
ready to postcard that. And then something did happen that made this <coughs> place uh, a place that everyone wanted to know something about. And I think when you're doing travel writing, you know, that's a very important thing to remember is that, you know, why would someone else want to know about this place besides Mark's friends and family, right? And something happened and it kind of became uh, a story there that uh, generated a lot more interest. Anything more to well, actually, uh, Adrian was uh, the deputy travel editor at the Toronto Star, and I came out as a, I, I was a newspaper reporter. So I, you know, if there was a volcano, I would explode it. I would go to that, but I would kind of look at the other things around. And the travel editor was a man named Jim Byers, and he also was the Olympics reporter at the. He was the Olympics editor at the Toronto Star, and so he said to me, "Why don't you ever try and travel right?" And I said, "Okay, well, there's only." things I would be interested in writing about. Uh, and that's, I think, another thing about travel writing is that what is it that would interest you? What would be um, uh, something that interests you that you think other people would be interested in? I said, I'm interested in literary uh, travels, in places where, um, you know, scenes from books, uh, you know, where, where something, uh, where you would read a piece of fiction. And to me, I wanted to see what those places were like. And I was very fortunate in that, uh, at that time when I started thinking about travel writing, uh, it, was a, it was the anniversary of the publication of To Kill a Mockingbird, which is based in Alabama. Um, this is our, our first panelist, Guillermo <laughs> Serrano. <laughs> My son is visiting me from Oakland, Ontario, and I said, you're going to see Daddy on the stage, so... So the first travel piece I ever did was about the, the 75th anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the publication of To Kill a Monster. And so I went to Monroeville, Alabama, which is where the book was uh, set, and I had this image of what to expect based on what I had read. But to go there and write about it, uh, you know, that was a very interesting experience for me. And I didn't realize that uh, travel writing kind of incorporated all of the skills that I needed as a reporter, which included, you know, being able to go and talk to people, being able to ask people about, you know, what is it about this place that I'm at that makes them feel a certain way? And I think there is a lot of that in travel writing. And that's what I love the most about travel writing, is the feelings that people have when they're in that place. What is it that it evokes? And what is the universal message that it tells people? So for, that was my first experience in travel writing, and I loved it. And I have to say, because Adrian can talk a little bit more about this. I came back from that assignment, and the first thing my editor asked me is like, what did you eat? Yeah. And I said, I just picked up sandwiches. And he said, I never want to hear you come back from a travel trip to say you picked up sandwiches <laughs> in a corner store ever again. You have to kind of eat what people eat. Ask what the you know what the local food is. What do people feel most proud of about you know where they are and, and what is it that they want me to try? You know, so that was a, a good lesson that I learned from my first travel assignment. Um, so uh, how I got started in travel writing, a bit of a kind of a serendipitous turn of events. I was a sports uh, writer uh, editor in uh, New York City, did one of those big bad tabloids for about ten years. Uh, ended up in Vancouver as the Vancouver Sun, that he sports editor for a bit, and then uh, ended up in Toronto and uh, the Toronto Star, and uh, but I had a graduate degree in uh, creative writing, and uh, the editor suggested creative writing would be uh, applicable to travel writing more than uh, sports. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> at first, I was a little bit disappointed, but uh, then things uh, worked out. Uh, something in travel writing, I got uh, published. I got some. And I quite enjoyed it. Um, and uh, when the opportunity came to leave uh, the Toronto Star, uh, the, uh, my wife, uh, Julia Bella, she was, uh, unfortunately, she passed away earlier this year, but uh, Julia and I, uh, we uh, started making it on with Peg. And um, uh, right away, it was a, got a lot of notoriety, uh, probably because of the quality of the, the drinks that we had, but we were tapping into this desire for travel, um, which isn't out there, and it was something when I was at the Star, uh, our readers were writing in regularly wanting to know more about Canadian destinations where you can take uh, a short drive to um, 
to this is around the time of the uh, uh, one of the times that the Canadian dollar wasn't doing so well, the economy wasn't doing so well, so the, the trip staycation was uh, was rising. So it seemed like a good opportunity to just uh, create something focused on uh, Canadian travel. And at the same time, uh, I had become uh, one of the, the judges for the World's 50 Best Press Conference, one of those uh, crazy um, uh, annual surveys that comes out. And every year, there would never be a Canadian restaurant on, on the list. And uh, I, I thought, uh, let's get our judges together and do, uh, launch a Canadian version of it. And that became uh, quite popular. And now we've spun it off as its own uh, website, uh, toprestaurantsincanada.com. Uh, and it's about uh, celebrating Canadian culture, destinations, and really tapping into kind of what Peg and Mark have been touching on in terms of the uh, what travel writing gives you as both a writer and as an audience, which is uh, an opportunity to cover a wide variety of topics, to touch on news aspects, to see a culture in, in a way that's you know, not hard hitting news. So Mark and I were in East on the best deal day. There, uh, the immediacy is getting the reaction of people on the ground there. But now that some time has passed, our job now is to put some context into what life is like there. How do people react there when an event like that occurs? What does that reaction tell you about that the culture of that, that community? And um, what uh, a reason for you to visit and what you can expect when you get there? Um, I think. Uh, uh, travel writing, yes, it's, it's more narrative and creative, but it, it gives you an opportunity to touch on topics in, in a way that isn't like news, and, but still has some of those elements of, of uh, uh, humanity in, 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 in almost a, a deeper way than the headline or something. Yeah, this was interesting. Before I, we were, as you mentioned, we were in Nice the day that that attack took place. We were interviewed by various publications. And the constant question was, you can, sorry, can you guys hear me now? If you're writing to Yeah, writing to right? No karaoke? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, we were in these, uh, Indian and I, and I wanted to add to this point. A lot of people were asking us about the, the uh, state of the city, the feeling, the vibe after the attacks, and the fear factor and everything. And it's almost like they wanted to create this sense of fear and, and I, we were both countering and saying, these people are, they're strong, you know, they, they took this blow and they're, they're going to they're gonna get through it. And certainly it should never dissuade anyone from going to that part of the world. When people, an incident happens in one city and suddenly the whole country is off limits. And part of travel writing is to break down those, those, uh, those assumptions and, and, you know, challenge fears that people have. Obviously, you're, there are certain elements that you don't want to you don't want to be going to war zones, but there's a lot of parts of the world that you would, if you read the headlines every day, you go, oh my God, I can't go. Right? But you want to go, and you have to support the people that live in these places. You know, tourism is a huge industry. Yeah, and, and yeah, just to kind of get to that too, is that it, uh, as a travel writer, part of your job is, uh, as a journalist, to report on the business of tourism, and when incidents like that happen, uh, your role is, in some, some part, to at least put, put some context into, into it, and. Uh, uh, a tourism board, when they're faced with a crisis situation, it's like any other company faced with a crisis situation, they're trying to um, go overboard and, and, and try to calm the any nerves. And there's a reason so in some destinations that you wouldn't want to go no matter what time of year. <laughs> but uh, if, for a place like Nice and French Riviera, I mean, right now I think it's a completely different situation than it was on July 14th, and then it's back to what the ideal place is. Talking about those places where people don't want to go, um, I had the chance to go to Colombia. I was born down there, and as you can imagine, an average person is like, "Are you serious? Are you going there?" And um, yeah, I went to I went there and just got blown up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> and um, it was quite interesting seeing Colombia again. I am from there, under the perspective of a Chinese woman. I was working with this person. And this person was writing about Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 years of solitude after his first anniversary um, of death. So I was with this person and it was amazing because the bottom line of 100 years of solitude is this little town called Macondo. It's a mythical place where magical things happen. So we end up in Colombia 
and suddenly we start seeing very or I start seeing very unique things. In one place, imagine a group of young uh, students, and I was a translator, and this woman was introducing herself. So the kids write their hands. Can we touch the hair of the woman? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm not sure if I understand that. Uh, excuse me, I think they want to touch your hair. And uh, this woman is Chinese. There's no many Chinese in Colombia. I would like to say almost non-existent. So if they want to touch, they want to know if this woman was real or not. <laughs> and you got a line of 30 kids touching the woman hair. And they were so happy. Yes, this is kind of real. That woman is for real. <laughs> so again, picture this. Where I was in Colombia looking for my condo. And I said, this is kind of my condo. Um, another interesting place um, in Cartagena, there was a street vendor. Before, I was a skeptic of trying street food. So I am uh, addicted to Anthony Bourdain. And through that guy, I was like, be brave, go and, and take that food. So I was able to, to establish a relationship with this woman. And I like the woman, beautiful human being, tall, black woman, beautiful woman. And, and I asked uh, her, excuse me, may I take a picture? And she said, no. Uh, um, OK, so I stayed at the other side of the street. And she said, wait a minute, stay there. And she started scanning me. Literally, she was looking at me. Yes, no, yes, no. Suddenly she said, go ahead, take your pictures. So this reporter started jumping at the same time. And she said, no. I said, he is said, go to take a picture. Like, you cannot. Uh, one of the most interesting things about this woman, she had a wig on her head, like a literal a, a wig uh, in here. What is that for? And the woman said to me, when men come violent, this wig calm them down. So when you are in front of a woman who thinks that she needs to uh, partner nature to stop a stupid guy who uh, smacks her face all the time, this is another way of thinking. She lives in a different world. Um, uh, and I feel admiration and respect. But sadness, a lot of feelings about the woman. But again, that woman doesn't live in a, she lives in my condo. That's the way that I see it, because she lives in a world that a piece of uh, weed is going to stop stupidity, male stupidity. Uh, so you start seeing, wait a minute, my condo is everywhere. Suddenly, at the end of the trip, I invite this, this person to go and see my grandmother. She got Alzheimer. She's 97 years old. She didn't see me in seven years. So I entered the room. My grandma says, hey, where you been? I was outside. Oh, cool. So the woman entered the room, and my grandmother was very upset. Because in Chinese culture, the old person gives you permission to say hello. So my grandmother said in Spanish, what's wrong with this woman? She, why she can say hi? Grandma, uh, she doesn't speak Spanish. I don't care, it's not all Spanish, it's about education. Grandma, calm down. She's a very strong woman. Again, 97 years old, Alzheimer, doesn't matter. <laughs> for some reason, for some things, she works very well. So I start saying the woman, the, 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 the Chinese woman say, say hello right now, why? Don't ask me questions. My grandma is going to have a heart attack if you don't say hello now. So my friend starts saying, hola, hola. Uh, so grandma, say it. She knows what education is about. So you start seeing um, all these elements. And I personally said, I want to write about what I found, the Macondo that I found in Colombia through the eyes of this Chinese woman. So I did that. And Probably I have the passion, but passion is not enough when you write a story. You need an amazing editor. So I found this great editor, and uh, we got this story, and I said the story, keep in mind that I don't have any background, neither in journalism, neither in writing, nothing like that. So I sent the story to the Toronto Star, and they said, oh, we love this story, it's amazing, for how long have you been writing? Well, uh, no idea, I don't know, even, I, I don't know how much to charge for my piece. And they love it, they publish, and since then, I believe I am a wannabe trouble writer. So that's my experience, and, and uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs>
a very demanding person, right? Oh, yeah. I want to see this. I want to see let, that. Let me share with you. Uh, Another thing that I found in this industry is that the younger the people, the more visual they are. So um, if you are planning to write for a younger audience, you need to go extremely visual. Very short sentences, which is great for me, because for me speaking Spanish, it's very complex to create a, a long statement or many sentences. So going back to the visual elements in this picture, as you can see, it's a beautiful woman, and I'm gonna use uh, I don't know, on top of the, her head, um, you see the wig. Yes. Um, it's amazing. And of course, that was the first question. What is that for? And she explained me how the whole thing works. Um, so yeah, so this woman helped me a little bit. And I wish, um, if I had the chance to go back to Colombia to share with her if, if she's OK, what happened out of that picture. Uh, because many people, oh, social media is amazing. Next day, people they start tweeting me. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And they said, this is great. We want to go to Colombia. I didn't understand the real power of social media. And um, so it was a learning curve from out of nothing, boom. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think, you know, if, if you want to peel back kind of what, what makes good travel writing, a lot of it comes down to talking to the people who are there and finding out their stories. Because while in some ways when you go to a place, it's you're you going to a place and writing about it, you only kind of understand the place by talking to people who, who are there. And you know, a lot of it is, you know, for, for us as reporters, we, we try to be respectful. We try not to kind of ask them questions that will lead them a certain way. We really genuinely, I, I think as travel writers, want to know what's it like here for you. Tell us your story. And you get so many stories out of that. And a lot of it comes from just seeing you know, just from noticing something because he noticed the woman with the, you know, this lace in her hair, right, uh, for no reason. And he asked her, what does this mean? What does it mean for you? Right? And I think there were so many kind of pieces in his article that when he came back, he realized this is, the story is someone coming back to a place and discovering it in a different way than they had imagined. Yeah, and, and, and the, other, the other aspect of that, too, is that uh, travel writing, I'm like, pieces of media is telling people where they want to go because I think that's more important than where you don't want to go so there's a lot of positivity in, in, in these articles and then what you're writing and the people you're spotlighting is usually people like independent business owners who are very passionate about what they do and the benefit for us from that, I mean for me, especially as we spotlight these people is that they can make a huge difference in terms of uh, their lives, you know, not just the, what they're doing but the, uh, I remember we wrote one story about the, a guy in Newfoundland who, uh, is, uh, because of the, the, the cod moratorium they have on fishing there, uh, he, did, he was making less than $30,000. He decided to start tours of his family village, uh, the historic family um, part of his culture. He wrote an article about it. It uh, ended up getting picked up by the New York Times, which they uh, did a story about last time I heard. He just sold out of tours and making over six figures. And then turns, he can turn someone into living in a rural, destitute area, turn their life around. Right, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not just the people that are running the operations of the Africa, for instance, like I think several times. You've got a safari operation, and you're paying a lot of money go there, that's great. But you are also, uh, you're also contributing to the livelihoods of the people who the lodge, their families, their extended relatives, the whole village, the whole community. So in a way, you know, it's, 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 it's a great way to connect with people, but it's also a great way to uh, contribute in some small way to, to, you know, to where you are and help people's lives. talked about submitting it to an editor so that you get paid. So a few questions about that. About how long should it be? And how, uh, about how much, what, what kind of price should you ask for? And do they always pay if you're starting out or only after you have a track record? How does that whole thing work? You know, this is a, a, when I was putting this panel together, Mark said, 
please don't say that you can get rich. Do, that. <laughs> <laughs> do not do that. You know, it, you really, it is for the experience. We, Adrian, you know, the three of us, sorry, <laughs> maybe one day, the three of us. <laughs> when I grow up. <laughs>
we will pay you to produce no, extra we're, particles. No, we're paying your expenses. Yeah. So essentially a fan trip where the writer Correct. is paid, uh, the writer's expenses are Correct. paid, Correct. and you're wanting to know is that the norm? Is that still the norm now? That, uh, I think for, the, the things are changing, lines are blurred uh, constantly. Um, for a destination, uh, Mark and I are going to Ecuador next month for a destination like Ecuador, which has had some uh, communicate, crisis communications issues lately. To get people to go down there, they're not going to be able to do it unless they pay our our airfare and our expenses. Um, we're not going to choose to go down there and tour the country for 10 days um, but in all likelihood. How about lonely planets? Corporate sponsor. So lonely planet, but not necessarily very objective as we hope they will be. Yeah, but from the from the inside, the, the newspaper and big media world hasn't been very objective for decades. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the the pay to play, if we can call it that, uh, is uh, been around for it, whether it's cars, which cars get reviewed, it's because those cars take the the, the car riders onto tri trips. Uh, why? What video games, what records, what concerts get reviewed? It's because they're giving tickets to to the journalists to cover it. So uh, if you look at it in that, um, that sense, getting travel writers to go to the destination to cover that destination is fits into uh, journalism. Uh, we are looking at the Rio Olympics now. All those journalists are not paying the $2,500 for a ticket to the opening ceremony. They're getting there for free because Brazil and the IRC wants people to uh, cover that event. Uh, there's a benefit to having coverage, paying for me and Mark to go down to Ecuador. Um, if we get one person to book a trip down there with our content, that more than pays the cost of what they're charging us. Um, and you know, we're not going to write anything that we don't believe in. That's yeah, that's something we're going to build. I get to ask this a lot about when you're going on fan trips, which you know, if you're fan trips are the destination will cover your expenses, basically. So you pay nothing. You go and you spend a week, two weeks, and you come back and you write some stories. And I often get asked, well, aren't you just bought and paid for it? Isn't this just mandatorial? Okay, are paying your expenses, so therefore they're, they're expecting you to deliver sunny, happy, wonderful stories. And I get, this, I get asked this a lot, and my personal position on this is that if I go somewhere, there's two things. One is, if I really am uncomfortable about something, I won't write about it. I'll give you an example of that. Last year I was in South Africa, and part of the fan trip was to visit a lion sanctuary. There are a lot of lion sanctuaries, a lot of wildlife sanctuaries in South Africa. This one in particular had uh, claimed that it was taking orphan lions, raising them, and then releasing them back into various states of the wild. I was a little skeptical. I went along with it. I didn't write about it. And then I did some homework when I got back, and I uncovered the fact that these guys were actually selling lions to canned hunting operations. I don't know if you're familiar with that. In South Africa, a lot of private enterprises will have reserves where they'll basically buy lions, and whatever else they want to kill, and then they'll, you know, they'll, they'll bring in hunters and charge a lot of money. So that was a bit as an ethical issue, right? So I didn't write about it. And the point is, if I feel that I'm uncomfortable about something, I'm not sure, I don't feel that it's ethical, I won't mention it. Could By be, omission, you I could will. You become a news reporter for that story. Yeah, I could. <laughs> it's been covered. So I'm, not, so I'm not interested in, you know. But I did talk to the, to the tourism board and I said, guys, you cannot be promoting this until you're clear that this is ethical because, you know, you're just contributing to the problem. So that's one point. Um, and the other point is that, um, um, you know, I, I, I have to take my own integrity into account. I'm not going to write about something that I have experienced and had, had you know, pleasurable experience. And also, on the other side of that, I don't want to be negative about a place necessarily because I'm there for three or four days a week. And who am I to come into a country, parachute into a country, and decide, well, this country is crap. It's, it's people are, you know, it's, it's people are thieves, and it's, it's all this stuff that you hear about, like these cliches, right? Who am I to say that after visiting a country for three or four days? So I try to look at the bright side, I look at the positive aspects of it. But if something, if there's something triggers my suspicions, I'll just that's how I approach it. Yeah, the industry has changed, like I mean, in newspapers, uh, the trade routes are different. Uh, the Toronto Star, when I first started in uh, 2005, were not allowed fan trips. And then gradually they started it. The same thing with the Golden Mail. So now, with, you know, uh, 
I encourage you guys to, you know, when you, you, when you read travel articles, to kind of read them, like read them as not just a consumer, but as a travel writer. And you'll see sometimes they'll say that, you know, this trip was uh, paid for, the writer was paid to go on this trip by this, you know, airline or by this uh, travel adventure company, but they think, but they're not, that, but they didn't see this article beforehand. So you're seeing that more and more. So there's not um, just, you know, some publications, yeah, some publications still don't allow it. I've written for CNN.com Travel, I've written for The Guardian. They're, they don't allow any kind of um, trips where it was uh, subsidized. So you have to be really careful when you're doing travel. Where are you going? Are you paying for this yourself? Who can you pitch it to and all of that? And I'll, I'll just touch on the social media aspect because that's really where the lines are becoming blurred. Um, I was uh, at the Canadian Tourism Commission, federal government agency that's uh, in charge of marketing Canada to the world. Uh, in that role, um, we would hire Instagrammers and uh, pay them, YouTubers, and pay them $15,000, $25,000 to come to Canada and do some content over the course of a week and leave and go to the next destination. So that's where the large sum of money is uh, right now. Uh, it's being paid by tourism boards, it's being paid by uh, brands. However, uh, I feel it's bad to be, um, I, I don't think that's going to sustain. I think uh, at some point, um, people are still going to want uh, good, credible uh, content as they uh, plan their trips and also I think on Instagram things one beautiful photo after another, after another, at some point it all becomes a blur. And how do you differentiate it and how do you track success on those channels? Thank you. So, uh, you hire people from outside the country to produce the social media as yeah. opposed to locals? No, 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 the, to locals in their markets. So the Canadian Tourism Commission markets Canada as a destination to bring people into the country yeah. in 11 um, markets in the world. So if someone has a large following in Germany, we would bring them in or there. Yeah. yeah. So because it's through their, their, their lens, right? So they're going to interpret Canada as a German audience would appreciate it. So that's why they're doing it. that could be a, a grown-up. So for us, it's very simple that 
when you try to explain that concept to a five years old, you have to go with a lot of, again, visual elements, try to show the relation between one and the other. So I wrote a story called Three Clicks Away, because three clicks are the, we only need three clicks in, in the internet to get into a situation that is out of control. Click number one, so that book was a progression of clicks. First click, he accessed the internet. He created the avatar, second click. Third click, he met this person, or avatar. And, and uh, the story has, there's a point where he makes to make a decision. Um, and that was one way for me to start uh, to get into this world. So um, uh, going back to Peck's comment, um, yes, that was the way that I started making this relation with books. Uh, and then I ran into trouble writing. And uh, one, 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 uh, something that I, fascin uh, I find interesting about this group is that you guys are um, going to places where I believe an average person like me, I don't go, I don't go to South Africa, I've never been there, it's a dream place for me. What is interesting again about this group is that I can be the simple guy uh, because I write about coffee. Where? Let's go to Seattle. There's a lot of things to write about coffee in Seattle. It's a mecca place. Even if we disagree, or many people with big corporation behind the, the, the coffee market, but those guys have something to say, or we have something to say about those big corporations. Um, you can go to amazing places, go back in Seattle, Analog Cafe, beautiful place, I love that. And again, if you enjoy taking pictures, make a great writing and put the most amazing picture. I don't know, Peg, if we can access um, one of the pictures that, that, that I have from Animal Cafe, probably see my website. Yeah, but I, that's, I see that's actually a really interesting point that you made about, you know, when you go and do travel writing, it's important to kind of get some universalness, universality yeah. in there, like um, coffee, everyone can relate to coffee, right? So if you write about coffee, whether it's in Bogota or whether it's in Seattle, it's something people can get, you know, they, they can associate with it for it. I think it's the same with novel writing, right? When you, when you go to these places, it's important to kind of remember what are some of the universal themes that you're tackling, that you're trying to answer, that you're questioning, even. And I think at the root of travel writing, that's a lot of what we do is like, what is the universal themes here that we have? And I want to finish one point with the coffee piece. I thought that was that like, if I was able to put the, my my Colombian piece in, in in that newspaper, I was like, this is gonna be uh, amazing. There, nobody bought it. Nobody was neither interested. Uh, but um, suddenly, I was having a conversation with someone, with the owner, with the president of a big change of restaurants in Canada, and this person was having an issue uh, with um, with the perception of the public, and he knew that I learned about coffee, and he said, hey, listen, I want to I wanna talk to you. So that piece that I was not able to monetize in any single way, suddenly there one person, and boom, the connection was there, because when he learned that I was able to write about coffee, he said, there's something that you have that I need to learn. So, yeah, so the opportunity is waiting in the most unexpected place. I want to... I want to add to that and kind of go off on a tangent. Um, but in terms of travel writing, we think about exotic places and ends of the earth, but actually a good way to get into travel writing is talk about what we know. Yeah. In other words, right here. Your chances of getting published somewhere are probably a lot greater if you write a really interesting story about your neighborhood or something that's involved in Vancouver or the Lower Mainland or by extension of the island, British Columbia, because you're an expert immediately. And there are a lot of publications around the world that want to know about this place. You don't have to get on a press trip, you don't have to raise a lot of money, but you can get published, get your foot in the door, and then you can graduate and grow from there. Sorry, and, and also, like, it's interesting because a couple of years ago, I'm from Winnipeg, I grew up there, and uh, I've been back for many years. So I went back to Winnipeg a couple of years ago, and I started with Global Mail, but, well, you know, kind of a return to my home town. And it was fascinating, you know, because so much changed. So it's always good to look at where you come from. If you come from a small town in BC, go back to it, find out what's new. You know, maybe there's a story there. Maybe there's, there's characters that you grew up with. What are they? You know, I was always looking for characters too, like people to be able to tell because that's your team, is to get a story told to you by someone about their life. That's your team, as far as I'm concerned. That's that makes it personal. You know, they become characters in a in a, in a, in a story. Uh, but yeah, 
look at right here before you think about around the world because there's lots of stuff that you don't even like. I'm guilty of this. I look around here. I don't think, oh, that's not that's not that interesting. But in fact, for people around the world, it's fascinating. Vancouver is one of the most talked about cities on earth for many reasons. So look around your neighborhood, look around locally, find stories that you can pitch to publications outside of Vancouver. And you know, we, we talk about you know journalism, like newspapers have changed, magazines have changed, but there's so many more outlets out there that didn't exist five years ago. So there's like, if you want to write about coffee, there are there are publications dedicated about coffee, right? And a lot of what Mark was saying, yeah, I teach journalism, and these are the things that we teach our, our students about what you look for when you look for a news journal, which applies to travel writing. You know, look for characters, look for extremes. Is something new happening, something unusual? Is this the first of its kind, or the last of its kind? I once did a story about the last two people in this small town in Saskatchewan, right? So you kind of think about those, like, all of those elements that make also makes a good travel piece, and it's always about you know a human emotion. You know, is something current? Is there a universal theme? Right? That comes out. So. Yeah. Um, are you all photographers? Mm, we've all had to be. Yeah. He, he, like, those two are photographers. Uh, Adrian was married to one of the best photographers in Canada, but we all have to learn. We all have to take pictures. Yeah, I was going to mention that one point. If you're going to be a travel writer. Got to have to take photos yeah. because the publications are not going to pay extra to bring a photographer along. They may buy stock photos, but if you want to sell a story and you've got to do photos, it's going to give you a big boost. It's really going to give you a lift. So it's important to, to you know, just to learn how to do the basics, right? And the good thing about digital is that, you know, when, I, when I'm out on a travel assignment, I take a lot of pictures just on my phone just so that I can remember things. Oh, what did the signs say? What was this highway turn off? You know, all of that stuff, it kind of helps you. But, you know, when you're doing travel, writing, and photography, think landscapes, think about the big scene, and then also think about the characters. Like, the, what that uh, Serrano had was about a one woman, right, sitting in the street. Like, that was a picture that they used to And uh, also, like, look into how can you do video. Mm -hmm. um, that's a uh, big yeah. selling point uh, these days, and it's not all that difficult to do if you've got uh, Instagram, you know, they started their Instagram stories two days ago, uh, which is really a bit video element uh, that they're kind of pushing for. My professional background is from IT, and I used to work with one of the largest uh, cell phone companies in Canada. Uh, what I found is that the amount of information that we can process with one image is way larger and, and, and than a long um, written statement. And, and if you think about all these platforms, is about visual interaction. Uh, so that's the whole idea. So we have to follow like our rules, but the world is telling us no. There are new rules. If I try to impose to us, hey buddy, you have to do things this way. No. Um, he, as a 12-year-old person, he has very clear standards um, that that in order for him to understand and get information. So again, visual is is extremely important. And, and again, uh, if you think about all these mobile sites, they're not just there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I just want to add to that. Uh, for me, for me, uh, photography, I didn't study photography, I just learned as I went. And I realized I had to take pictures to sell the stories, basically. And then I got into it, and actually I liked it better than writing. <laughs> uh, but each of these, for me, literally tells a story. Each of these photographs tells exactly where I was, what the context was, and it's a great, it's almost like writing notes to yourself. You know, that photograph, like this lion up at the top left, he and his brother were literally the last lions in this park. They survived so many battles, and they, they, they'd gone through the wars together. And I have shots of the two of them, and they look like little soldiers, you know. All this stuff came to my mind, and that re really created the gist for the beginning of the story. These two brothers and survived all sorts of you know, battles and catastrophes and everything, and we're still standing, you know, scars in his face, et cetera, et cetera. So all these, all these photographs for me tell a story, literally. So it's great for my notes. It's great for remembering, uh, sparking, you know, creative ideas. So photography for me, is, as much as selling it for me personally, it is, it's great for for remembering, you know, and 
the details too. So it's important that you, when you go and want to be a copywriter, be a photographer too. Don't get and don't get intimidated by you know all these pros that have to carry around uh, you know, pro cameras and all this stuff. I mean, you seriously, you can make a feature film in this thing. You know, it's amazing. So it's it's level the playing field, but really it's not about the technology; it's about your eye and about what you capture. I have a personal um, experience with that. Being uh, from Colombia, I decided to write about coffee from Colombia. So I went there and I found that I don't like Colombian coffee. I think it's so boring. <laughs> How you can tell Colombians that you don't like their coffee? Oh, what's wrong with you? Because you are living in Canada, you are not proud of who you are, where you come from. Seriously, but I have to be honest. How can I would point to say that it's a great coffee? If I, I, I know it's a personal experience coffee, but my personal experience is that it's so simple, it's so boring. Um, so I was thinking, how can I tell the Colombian readers that they do have a good product? So Colombians, uh, they are very proud about uh, how beautiful the women are. So I was like, okay, so probably that gives me an idea. Because you don't have one First Nation prototype of beautiful women in Colombia, neither one white woman, neither one is Spaniards, so you have a mix. When you have that mix is when you get that, in the, uh, technically talking, beautiful Colombian woman. So I was like, okay, so I'm gonna try to say that Colombian coffee or single origin coffee is not as good as blended coffee. So I used that analogy to explain how great Colombian coffee is as far as you mix it with something else, which I believe, and they, they feel proud because <laughs> I took the element of the beauty of the Colombian woman. And so I think that was a win-win situation. So I was able to tell the truth. Um, and believe me, it's not seriously. It's, it's a country that has so many few things to feel proud of. Uh, it's like when you talk about soccer in Argentina, we, for us it's, it's fun. No, if, if you start laughing about their losing a game, they, they can be extremely violent. Uh, in Colombia, uh, uh, it, it's a, there's a lot of passion. Again, they, they have very few things to feel about, proud about. And one of the, those few things is Colombian coffee. Um, uh, so it was, it was, it was a, yeah, a trick for me, and I think I was able to, to make it. Because there's no sense of my audience out there. Uh, uh, just a quick word on truth. 
true, the mean truth is very subjective. Uh, it's when, whenever you're talking about anything negative or positive, corroboration is where uh, you want, right? The supporting evidence of whatever opinion you're putting forward will help the reader accept that opinion, believe you more. You're talking about, you've lived in Florence for 30 years. Are you talking about I mean, uh, the people there? Are you talking about their, the cliches about them and the reality? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, oh, because of the fact you've know. lived there for 30 years, it gives you some credibility, obviously. Um, also, I think if I was to approach that, I would use humor and self-deprecation and kind of, you know, a bit of sort of irony about it. You know, like this is the image of these people. This is the reality. You know, but but not not in a not in a negative way, but in a kind of a reality check way. You know. Yeah, and even humor. Like I, I got the idea because I would tell people stories about yeah. them, they wouldn't believe. Them. Exactly. That's and great. Those them. stories are what you. Know, those are the. Those are the. Those the gems, right? And and if you can make people laugh, and you can, and without without degrading the people that live there, because and also find the universal aspects. Everybody, you know, we come to Vancouver. There's all these cliches about Vancouver, right? Well, we know we live here. It's not really true, at all that, right? So that's the fun part, you know, is to bring out that stuff that people can relate to around the world, you know. And I think it'd be a great story. You, know? you have a title for it? Under the Tuscan Sun. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah. 
but it just takes a lot more work to steal something, and it's a lot easier to take it for yourself. <laughs> um, I, I'm under the impression that you increase your chances of getting a, an office right if you uh, know when people want their vacations. This is all about being That's a really good point. Yeah, it's uh, seasonality is a huge in, in our industry. So uh, post Labor Day is when Canadians usually start looking at their winter travel plans, um, and that's around the time when publications start looking to publish stories about Disney World and uh, LA. And certainly in October uh, is when ski articles start coming out for the season, uh, and uh, January, February, March break stories uh, come out. It's a constant cycle like that. That doesn't change when there's big events happening. You know, everyone was publishing stuff about Brazil probably two years ago because of the Olympics. Next year, Canada's going to be huge because of the 150th anniversary of the country. So. And the lead times for magazines especially are long. So you get a six months, almost to a year by the head of calendars. So think about that when you're pitching the magazines. I know it's hard because you don't know what you know, a year from now what the world's going to be like, but they do have a long not so much for newspapers and web, but definitely. Yeah. I think here yeah, in North America, it's Christmas and August that are big, 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 not the spring break, maybe. Is it the same all over the world to a certain extent? No, 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 no. 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 Okay, so Weather in the Caribbean days in, this, in the south is way different. Yeah, when you're in South, when you're in Argentina, there's summers in January. Right? So. Yeah. So, so. You mentioned publications of the pitch outside the country. And is there a way of finding English language, or does it necessarily do they translate them, or uh, where can we find uh, somewhat back, open? Yeah, back back in the day when uh, not everything was on the internet, there was an annual list called the uh, Publishers and uh, Literary Agents Guide that was being published. You pick it up into chapters or find a copy of the library. Lately to see if that's online, but so I would imagine some version of it would be online if you did a Google search for English language magazines in the United States or United Kingdom and looking for editors. So it might be something like that, but uh, the, the publishers of the Reverie Agents Guide, uh, you can find that's it's still being published. I think that's just that's yeah. That's yeah. Searches and come up there. Go ahead. I don't know if you touched on this because I came a little late, but writers who have their own travel blog, are they where they're actually buying their ability to influence their audience that they've built and, and created? Are they in competition to the travel writing uh, that you do? We have about 30 travel writers writing for us. Or maybe 30, no, 30 travel writers, and they all have their own kind of following, they all have their own kind of specialty and stuff like that. Um, one thing that we didn't want to do, like we didn't want to make it our travel site, we wanted to, when we did vacate, we wanted to make sure that it was, you know, a lot of different voices talking about Canada. So the thing about travel writers, travel bloggers is what we call them, travel bloggers is that they, they write from their perspective, right? And you, you know what you're getting, if someone is specializing in family travel, you know, uh, you know, you know that their their focus is going to be about you know the destinations that you go when you take your kids. Kind of thing. Um, I don't see them as competition. I I do know that they uh, some of them have very large following that is being chased by people who organize families. But uh, at the end, it's it's your story, right? And you have to be able to write a story. You have to be able to see it, and you have to be able to tell it and pitch it, right? So it's all about what you can produce as a writer. And I feel that's a good thing. You're all able to go out there and travel, and you're all able to kind of go out there and pitch some stories. But having a travel blog, does that not undermine your ability to be able to sell travel stories? I mean, because if you put it on the blog, your market, I'm sorry. Like you're cannibalizing your own market in a sense? Yeah, I mean, 
Well, I mean, I know bloggers can sell and have their own blog and mix it on demand. And the story is just different. Is yeah. The story is a link to the publication's article where you, where you have an excerpt on your own blog. Right? I mean, having, a, having a blog is almost, I would say, a necessity these days so that okay. you have an online presence so that when you are pitching, that uh, editor can click and see who you are and read what you've written and what you're back on. Yes, yeah. you did set up. Yeah, not necessarily a blog. My site is, I don't publish blog entries on my site. My site is purely an online CD. Yeah. Photos, stories, background, that's it. So yeah. the editor can instantly go and see, see what you've written, where you've written, except where you've been published, all that stuff. Okay. And that's how you, that's, that's gold. And that. do you keep your, uh, the things that you've published, do you have them on your yeah, blog site? Yeah, I update side? them all the time. So Every time there's a story published, I'll, I don't put, I don't replicate the story on my site, I just have a link to it.